This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash speaking my movies. Belarus, 1943. A young boy named Clara Gaishun is fixing his gun with a dressing. Ahead of him are soldiers frantically moving around, packing their gear and carrying wounded men to safety. Suddenly, a faint sound of a whistle is heard from a distance. The boy turns around to see a young girl limping toward him, covered in blood with a whistle in her mouth. Once the girl stops moving, the two blankly stare at each other, their eyes lacking soul, emotionless and static. As the boy murmurs a cryptic phrase and turns around to join the others, we see this. The scene you just saw comes from Elam Klimov's 1985 film, Come and See, which is widely regarded as one of, if not the most disturbing anti-war films ever made. There are countless videos and articles discussing the film's unhinged depiction of violence and tragedy, and yes, there are a lot of disturbing moments in this film, but for me, it has always been this particular shot that made the biggest psychological impact. The most noteworthy aspect of this shot is its use of a split diopter lens, a piece of half-convex glass that can be attached to the main lens of the camera to create an illusion of a deep focus. This basically means that both Fiera and the girl will be in focus despite their distance from the camera. Because this isn't how objects are normally seen, many films try to cover the out-of-focus boundaries between the two subjects to make the image seem more natural. However, in Come and See, the blurred space is never hidden. If anything, it's emphasized. This amplifies the strangeness of the image and creates a strong sense of unease in the viewers. Split diopter shots also connect the subjects that are in focus by, well, keeping them both in focus. By revealing the girl through a slow pan, the film links the boy's state of mind with hers, suggesting that the nature of the two characters' trauma is essentially identical. This is why in the preceding shots, the camera captured each character as if they were facing one another, when in fact they were most likely separated. It's a cinematic depiction of their situational connection and their physical disconnection. Neither Fiora nor the girl are able to process the shared traumatic events that befell them. In short, they are alone, together. But this isn't the only split diopter shot in this scene. There is another shot that uses a horizontal split just minutes earlier. Another effect of a split diopter lens is that it allows the shot to provide more information. The hysteric energy of the running soldiers imply urgency, while the calm, impassive movement of Fliara illustrates his mental detachment from the situation. By keeping both Fliara and the soldiers in focus, the scene allows the foreground and the background to communicate their stories without interruption, and it's up to you to move back and forth between them to connect the dots. Tying this concept to the previously described effects, the resulting picture tells the story of a young boy in the midst of a mental breakdown, surrounded by horror, but silently locked inside his own head. This is why, despite the screams around him, Fliara and the audience alike hears nothing but an irritating drone, and later, the whistle. As you can see, the essence and the true horror of Come and See is in the experience of an experience, a shared perspective more than the rationale behind its narrative development. This means that the context required to better understand the dread of the scene has little to do with the story of the film, but with the rest of the film language that surrounds it. And the best way to notice the highlighted language is to cut the film into chunks and observe their repeating patterns. Come and see can be divided into roughly 12 sequences, each with three prominent tricks. The sound, the color, and the camera. One of the most intriguing aspects about the sounds of Come and See is that most of them are presented from the perspective of Fiera. While the climactic scene of the German soldiers killing the villagers features a variety of different sounds that collide with one another, it accents only two distinct tones. The unreasonably bright quality of the yodeling and the laughs, and the rough and bleak texture of the screams and fire. The accented juxtaposition makes a logical sense if you consider the audible elements as an echo of Fiera's state of mind. In other words, you're hearing a selective audio, where the sounds Fliara chooses to focus on are heard louder than others. 
This first happens right before his departure to the partisan camps, where the sound of the birds at the other end of the room are heard with clarity. A similar thing happens with a man's voice when he is looking around the camp, and with a radio when he's cleaning the pot. The initial uses of selective or subjective audio are easy to miss, as their primary objective is to establish the idea of perspective, showing that the world around Fiora is slowly intruding and affecting his mental state, whether he realizes it or not. It's only when the film reaches the 30 minute mark that the audio trick takes on a more significant and noticeable role, psychologically isolating Fiora and cornering the audience into his subjective terror. In sequence 5, the bomb that nearly kills him and the girl he met at the camp, Glasha, deafens his ears, muting the sounds of the world with a never-ending drone. Glasha. Although the muffled world slowly goes back to normal, the drone never quite disappears, and the audience is forced to stand the stressful noise until the very end. In sequence 6, the buzzing of the flies enters Fleora's subconscious, adding an incomprehensibly repulsive energy to the setting. As the scene progresses, it becomes more and more evident that his family members have been killed, and the buzzing becomes a direct link to this horrid reality. When the truth is visually revealed, the built-up tension from the audio makes the violent aftermath that much more disturbing. In sequence 7, the same trick is used as a tool of dramatization. Here, Fleora plows through the group of surviving townspeople to find his dying uncle. The same uncle who warned him against digging up holes to look for abandoned guns at the start of the film. At first, the crying of the townspeople is all he can hear. But as soon as his uncle begins to talk, the loud cries of the people disappear, and it's only his uncle's words that remain audible. Nearing his last breath, his uncle blames Fleora for finding the gun, suggesting that the Germans probably found them because of his actions. With this, the mourning of the crowd returns, and Fleora is sent into a spiral of guilt and despair. The overtly selective audio exaggerates the gravity and immersiveness of the situation, but never lessens the believability. After all, from a subjective point of view, the apparent manipulation is a rather authentic reflection of reality. That's why from this point on, the film repeatedly mixes in the rumbling of an airplane engine as a part of its main ambience, and spotlights it in moments of extreme violence. The cruising aircrafts are a symbol of Fiora's guilty conscience, reminding him that all the pain and suffering of the people around him could have been avoided if he didn't look for that gun. Of course, the attack would have happened regardless, it's really not his fault at all, but he doesn't know that. This is also why we hear the exact same whistle sound twice in the last sequence, once when the girl approaches, and again when Fleora joins others to see the captured Germans, because it creates a mental connection between the German soldiers and the girl, reminding Fleora and the audience of their despicable actions. This is how the characters are used in Come and See, as a tool adopted for the portrait of destruction, devoid of humanness and meaningful character development. The German soldiers have no real human qualities. The characters Fleura encounters have no real depth. Even Fleura himself, putting aside the loss of innocence, lacks qualities of a typical protagonist. We see comparable deterioration, but no true backstory, conveyed thoughts, or humanized expressions. He never spends time with his family, nor does he communicate ideas outside his passion for becoming a soldier. It's a sketch of a simple joy, a simple sadness, that converts with time into pure rage and hostility. He is but a victim of violence, a trail of human degradation. But could immersion alone save a film from absence of appreciable transformation? If not, perhaps it's the disassembly of a human form itself that behaves as the arc in this film. A simplified version of ourselves filled with a single emotional drive to revenge, or better yet, no emotion at all, a true depiction of trauma. Bringing the human characters to a standstill, the maturation instead happens from outside the narrative realm, through colors on screen. Chiefly relying on analogous and complementary color schemes, the film initially paints the screen with thick blue-green combinations to illuminate the hopelessness of the world. 
The color scheme then periodically contrasts with different shades of orange to imply a glimpse of hope in some scenes and conflict in others. When the film reaches its emotional height, the opposing color pattern shifts from blue and orange to purple and red, removing all traces of hope and replacing them with rage and violence. Once the peak has been resolved, the film returns to its original blue-green spectrum, ending the overwhelming journey on passivity and dejection. But this doesn't mean that the film treats all characters as a pointless gimmick. Cinematically, there are plenty of intricacies to be found in the seemingly stale characters. It could even be argued that the effectiveness of Come and See in large part comes from its self-restraint. The main reason why the camera floats around like a ghost, a neutral observer, is because it finds no need to force anything. The unrelenting reality before your eyes should enter as unprocessed as it can be, because that's what makes everything more terrifying. Like the sounds, the emotional overtone of the scenes evolve with the movement of the camera, going from excitement, sadness, and an ominous inkling to threat, fear, and eventually, terror. Yet the dynamic movement of the camera is only a small portion of the film. The majority of the shots present in Come and See is static, with over 60 of them being medium to regular close-up portrait shots. By pairing the close-ups with the film's 137 aspect ratio, the characters get locked inside the frame with little to no other visual information on screen, obliging the audience to stay and witness the evolution of the different characters. This is most evident from the gradually mutating portrait shots of Fiora, which illustrates the detrimental effects of war and develops his character without verbal explanations. But the same principle applies for other characters of the film, as the portrait shot essentially photographs a moment in history, telling an untold story of an individual with just a stare. In one way, the characters are communicating through that stare, stating our inability to intervene. What started off as the characters looking outside the frame switches to them looking directly at the audience, and by the end it becomes the audience who are looking at them, as if gazing at a mirror. The frequent use of portrait shots in Come and See is as questionable as it is impressive, because in most cases, such a theatrical shot would diminish the immersion by reiterating the existence of the camera outside the screen. So how does the film manage to bypass the negative symptoms of the stylish composition and only underscore the strength? Indeed, the film's unique direction isn't the only thing that helps cover the side effects. It's also because Come and See fully embraces the theatricality of its techniques. The dramatic choreography of the actors and the camera is apparent from the start. Staging the scene like an arena and having the characters move toward or away from the camera to create depth instead of having the camera do the work. But they never once feel overdramatic. Rather, each scene feels like a true motion picture, a combination of still images that create an illusion of movement. They operate like a photograph. There are photo-like aesthetics everywhere in Come and See, from character placements, framing of background objects, to actual scenes with a camera. There are different interpretations of the scene where Fiora stops himself from shooting the gun when a photo of Hitler as a baby pops up on screen. Many think of his voluntary restraint as an active portrayal of his humanity, that Fiora has managed to retain his benevolence even after everything has been through. But I see it differently. There are two noticeable uses of a dolly zoom in this film. Once in the partisan camp when the soldiers are taking a picture, and once before Fliora shoots the portrait. As unrelated as the two events may seem, they are linked through a very particular message, that what is done cannot be undone and can only live through your memory. Photographs are just the same. It is all about capturing a moment that will never return. In Come and See, the act of taking pictures is a gesture of desperation, sometimes to celebrate and at other times to never forget. That's why the film doesn't end with Flora shooting the portrait, but with him joining the rest of the troop and moving forward. Because the war is not over. 
The last shot of the running troops, therefore, is in no way a downplay of Fiora's uniquely individual and frankly horrific journey, nor a glorification of his endurance. It is the face of war, a visual representation of its dehumanizing nature. Why would the camera have lingered on their faces if not to cherish their remaining character, to mourn after their loss? Why else would the film have restrained itself from giving them a conventional arc, if not to emphasize the brutalization of their humanness? While the collective image of individuals signal a lack of relevance and importance, their individuality speaks a story just as tragic as Fleuras. But like I said, war is war, and nothing more. If it only dehumanizes, it's only logical that it ends without humanization. After all, the film did invite us all to come and see for ourselves. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. Well, Come and See is no easy film to watch. It is also a beautifully shot and crafted film with so much to learn from. And I hope this video conveyed that enough for you to go check it out if you haven't already. And if you have watched and loved Come and See and want to see more films like it, I recommend you to check out Mubi, the sponsor for today's video. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. And since every film is hand-picked, it's a great way to watch films you love and discover new films you haven't seen before. For instance, in Canada where I am, Mubi recently released one of my favorite war drama films called Phoenix. It's a gripping film about a German Jewish woman who underwent reconstructive surgery on her face after surviving Auschwitz and meets her former husband to see if he has betrayed her. It's an exquisitely shot and elegantly paced film with tons of cinematic tricks to pick up on. And right now, you can head over to movie.com slash speakingmymovies to watch Phoenix and other outstanding works for free for 30 days. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash speakingmymovies. So go check it out. And again, thanks for watching.